I'm standing here in the galleries, the Japanese galleries at the Portland Art Museum, and we are looking at a recent acquisition. It is a ewer, which is a particular kind of pitcher uh, that comes to us from late 16th century Japan. The first thing that comes to mind is its material, because when I first walked up to this, I imagined in some way, probably because of the, the sides, that it was, that it was metal. And, um, and when I came close to it, I realized that it wasn't. It, it's wood, is that right? Yes, it's wood. And what's interesting is that the body, and we often talk about pots in this anthropomorphic way, the body has a very slight, I mean, it's almost a cylinder, but it tapers a little bit at the foot. So the body is sort of in the shape of a bucket. This isn't carved from a single block of wood, but it's rather um, a strip of wood that was steamed and wrapped. Then we see these things that, these ridges on it, those are actually strips of bamboo that are sort of like little reinforcing girders that help hold that steamed wood in that wrapped cylindrical shape. So it's really a, a, a process of construction that's, that's made in a way that is not dissimilar to the way that we might treat metal. If you think of a sheet of metal hammered and, yes. and, and then bent, um, that's like that. And, and what is so interesting, if we think, OK, what are the normal ways that you handle wood? Well, we think of carving Yes, wood. exactly. That idea of, of making a vessel by wrapping a slab of wood into a cylinder and then putting a bottom on it. That is a technique in which Japanese woodmakers excel. There's a kind of delicacy and a kind of, I think that I get the sense of the thinness of that, yes. of the wall that seems to me only possible in metal. And I think that's why I jumped there. Mm. Um, but, but I think that really speaks to the extraordinary sort of tradition out of which this is coming. And it, I see it as incredibly impressive. And can we talk a little bit about the way the wood is treated and the color, which I find beautiful. It's got this almost gorgeous, almost patina. Yes, it, it, it does have a patina. This ware, it's an example of Japanese lacquer ware. So the wood turning, the wood bending, the wood shaping happens. And then it goes through a number of stages of being coated with lacquer. And, and lacquer is found really in much of Southeast Asia and uh, East Asia. But in Japan, Japanese lacquer was so treasured by the Europeans when trade began that analogous to the way that we use the word China to associate ceramics with China, Europeans used to call works that were lacquered Japan. Oh, is that right? It was so associated with Japan. And lacquer is the sap of a lac tree. It's, it's a naturally occurring sap. So think of maple syrup and think of it as something that, um, you know, trees ooze out at a particular season of the year. You have to go and tap it. Um, and it's thick and viscous like maple syrup. Interestingly, it's also toxic. Oh, really? It has the same chemicals in it that poison ivy does. Ooh. So lacquer workers have to spend a lifetime building up resistance to this. So you have this lacquer, and then you can, the, there's sort of traditional colors to dye it. And in Japan, those two traditional colors were black, which you did essentially by mixing lamp black, a kind of soot, okay. with it. And the other was um, what you see here, this fantastic cinnabar red by mixing in cinnabar, which is a powdered mercury. It, oh, so this was toxic in two this levels. This is toxic on two, two levels, levels. yes. Um, I suppose one was safe drinking water out of this, but it, it does sort of bring that to mind. Um, um, well, but by the time it dries, it's all okay. that toxicity right. is gone. So, so what happens is lacquer, um, it has to be painted on in many, many coats. But what lacquer does, and lacquer is used in East Asia from the fourth century BC onwards, lacquer can make a wooden object like a high-fired porcelain. It can make it perfectly impervious to leaks. So, and it can, it can hold hot water, it can hold cold water, so it's, it can handle a variety of temperatures. Um, it's perfect for containers for liquids. It's also gorgeous. I mean, the, the surface has a kind of, almost a kind of translucence that's this kind of milky, kind of beautiful. Is that original or is that a, a, um, a result of its age? Well, both, because, because it's many layers of lacquer. And the layer, lacquer layers are very, very thin, and then they have to dry, and then it's polished. Okay. Uh, and then other layers put on, and it's polished. And the secret of this particular wear this comes from a monastic workshop in Japan. 
Um, and it's called Negoro, that's the name of the monastery, so we call this Negoro Ware. First, several layers are black, and then the last layers are red. And at, you can, if you look at the handle, you can see where it is touched the most often. The lacquer has worn a little bit yes. thin, and a little bit of the black is coming through. And that is the secret of Negoro Ware. It's seeing that suggestion of black underneath the red. It gives an incredible that, dimension. It's like looking to this pool of red and then seeing the black underneath. But it, I think it really gives this depth. This is an object that comes from the 16th century. Yes. And yet it is so pristine. It is in such incredible condition. I mean, it, it looks as if it was made uh, just a few years ago. Um, and it, it speaks, to, I think, to the resilience, as you were saying, of the lacquer. Mm -hmm. um, but is it also that these were because they were in a monastic environment, that these were uh, kept sort of out of, out of everyday use. Is this, why, why would this be in such good condition? Do we have any idea? Although Nagoda ware is very, very highly treasured today, and this particular shape, and in this condition, is extremely rare, we know of two similar pieces in American collections, but that's all that I know of right now. Wow. Um, of this particular shape, this shape belongs to a particular moment in history. But it's not, it would not have, to its original uses or its original makers, been a particularly a precious object. Okay. So we wouldn't think of it the way that Chinese would think of something of jade. So this, is, this was not safeguarded as a particular. So it wouldn't special. have been hidden away. Okay. And in fact, that's great, because look at the wonderful black that we can yes. see in the handle. So it's not something that was brought out at Christmas. You okay. know, it was something that would have been used. But you're quite right that um, because it was in a monastery, and monasteries are likely to have the resources to have a big, huge storehouse with, you know, foot thick or two foot thick uh, clay walls mm -hmm. that it would not be subject to the kind of frequent fires that would happen to, let's say, an urban okay. merchant's collection. That's one. And the other thing that's very important, tea objects were treated with a special reference. So now, they, that's they, different from being precious, right? if you know what I mean. Yes. I mean, I'm not talking about they preciousness of the material but they were revered and taken care of very well. So the Japanese would make polonia boxes, and they would keep it in the polonia box, which keeps it from expanding and contracting in different weather. And that's, so they, they take exceptionally good care of things. It is absolutely gorgeous, and I have a, a, a totally new appreciation for it. Thank you so much. I'm glad you like it.